back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a furry friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful domestic cat. This episode was requested by quite a few of you, so just bear with me for a moment. Saturn, Rain, Margie, Jenny, Megan, Anna, Scarlet, Amy, AZ, Claude, and Sam, Kaylin, Laureen, Mobina, Eric, Caroline, Aaron, Heather, and Jesse. It is amazing that there are so many of you writing into the show to request your animals that it takes me quite a while to read the episode dedication, but I have to give credit where credit is due, so thank you to all of you who requested this episode, and if you would like to request another animal that you think would be interesting to learn about together, you can send in your animal request on relaxwithanimalfacts.com by going to the Submit and Animal Request tab. Just a couple of preliminary things before we get into the show. If you would like more Relax with Animal Facts, including episodes that don't have any intro, which is what this is right now, you can get this while supporting the show's mission by going to patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts or by clicking the Patreon link in the description. A huge shout out to George Vlad for the ambiance used in this episode. His work is linked in the description or the show notes as well. And now let us begin to wind down a little bit. If you are listening for the first time, I am so grateful that you have taken the time to join me on this adventure. And if you are returning, you know exactly what I am going to be asking of you. I have three primary exhortations for you. My first encouragement to you is to put on your favorite pair of running shoes. We are definitely going to be needing those for where we are going today. And my second exhortation, I think, might be the most important one, and that is to notice perhaps where you are carrying some tension. It might be in your head, in your neck, your arms. Everyone here is different, but my exhortation is the same. Do your best to relax whatever it is that you are tensing, and you can even bring up in your mind your favorite flavor of jello, and do your best to impersonate it. We here on this podcast become the jello, and my last exhortation to you is that you give your mind permission to wander and journey with me as we go into the warm climate of Egypt where the domestic cat resides. We have been to many places in Africa, but I don't think we have ever been to Egypt before. Now cats are found all over the world due to the fact that they are domesticated. But the reason I thought it would be interesting for us to go to Egypt together is because of the history of the cat's domestication. And we will just put that on a slight pause as we go into what the domestic cat is. For many of you listening, this might not be all that necessary, but you still might learn something. Whether or not you are a dog person or a cat person, if there's anything we have learned together, it is that each and every animal has some wondrous characteristics that we can appreciate even if we don't own them. I am quite frankly a little surprised it took us over 160 episodes to cover the cat, but here we are. The scientific name of the domestic cat is the Felis catus. But there is not only one kind of domestic cat. Just like dogs, there are many cat breeds, in fact at least 45 of them. And away from here in Egypt, In the United States, for example, there are over 45 million households that have at least one cat. This means that for those of you in the United States and in other parts of the world where cats are 
quite a common pet, you have likely come into a few of these breeds, and the breeds differ from one another quite dramatically. We are talking hair texture, the color of their coat, the length of their tail, even their temperament. Now, in the future, there is definitely need to go over some of these domestic breeds in specific, though I thought it helpful to start with the broad domestic cat and work our way into what makes each one special. We have actually already covered one of these cat breeds, and that is the Maine Coon. We learned about them before, and they happen to be the largest of the bunch. When we learn about the smallest breed of cat, we will find ourselves in Singapore. We still have the smallest breed of cat that is native to Singapore to explore. And what of those unusual looking cats that is the Sphinx cat? Those that are almost completely hairless that have a very rich history. Now their weight can vary between 5 to 20 pounds. That's about 2.5 to 9 kilograms for those who prefer that measurement. And their size on average will be about 28 inches. There is evidence that people began to domesticate the cat in the Fertile Crescent some time ago. In fact, thousands of years ago. And when I say Fertile Crescent, another phrase for this is the Cradle of Civilization. It is called a crescent because it is the crescent-shaped region that is in Western Asia and North Africa. This covers the modern-day countries of Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Iraq, Turkey, and Egypt. And so, researchers say that these once wild cats were probably drawn to the human settlements in this fertile crescent, basically coming for mice and scraps of food. Cats in general have always been seen as rodent catchers. They were so good, in fact, that many would bring cats onto their ships on long voyages in order to keep mice and rats at bay. There is also evidence of a very early cat domestication occurring in China, this domestication being completely independent as far as we know, and there they instead domesticated the wild cat species, the leopard cat. Now, of course, the cats that we have today aren't really related to leopard cats, and so it seems that this domestication didn't last the long term. And so here in Egypt, we are standing in a very historical place for cats, and a very cultural and even religiously significant place for cats, as we'll find out later. I'd like to point out that there is so much information as regards the cat, as we can expect, that I'm not going to be able to delve as deeply as I'd like on each fact. I will do my best, but I hope I don't get many angry emails of things I could or should have covered. And so the domestic cats that many people have in their homes today are small, carnivorous members of the family Felidae. And you can know that while you live with your cat now, there were people living with cats before you, and before that, and before that, reaching thousands of years into the past. Let's start with a fact that is maybe a little less known. Cats have around the same number of brain cells in their cerebral cortex as brown bears. The cerebral cortex is a part of our brain that is responsible for higher level processes. This includes things like language, reasoning, thought, learning, decision making, even personality and intelligence. So, it suffices to say that it is a very important part of the brain, and cats have around the same amount of information processing cells in theirs as the bear does. This is interesting because the size of a bear's brain is about 10 times larger than that of a cat's. The bear has about 251 million information processing cells, while the tabby cat has 250 million cells, just about 1 million off. Now, while that might sound like a lot, and maybe in some sense it is, 
let us just take into account that we as human beings have up to 26 billion cells, not million. That is a thousand million times 26. And so this shows that cats are pretty intelligent. There is some debate between cats and dogs, which ones are smarter or more intelligent, but there seems to be competing research and maybe some factions forming. I'm not going to personally comment. I have a dog and am left with quite a bit of bias, but I am still, as a dog owner, quite impressed with the cat so far. Researchers say that cats display something known as object permanence. This is a fancy word for just describing a phenomenon in which we can recognize or realize something still exists even when we don't see it. When I blink or if I turn away and I don't see you anymore, that doesn't mean you have gone out of existence, you're still there. And this is something that we take for granted. And this is very important for the cat as a hunter. It would be difficult for them to hunt mice if once the mouse left their vision, they treated it as if it did not even exist anymore. There is still much to be done in terms of cat research. It can be difficult because they are notoriously challenging to work with. If you have a cat that obeys your directions, I would love to meet them. And they don't change up their personalities in the lab either. One study that was done just a few years ago came up with the conclusion that cats do seem to understand some emotion. The findings suggest that your house cat can indeed process basic emotions even when it is displayed by another species. In this experiment, pet cats were shown pictures of both happy and angry humans equipped with audio cues of happy, joyful laughing and growling angrily. They would play the sounds with the correct image, meaning the laughing sound with the happy and the growling sound with the angry, but they would sometimes switch it up and so it would be mismatched. And based on how long the cat took to process the image of it being confused or looking curiously, they came up with that conclusion. And so these researchers say that cats over this long time of domestication have developed peculiar social skills to help them understand us better. After thousands of years of domestication, I can confidently say that I am absolutely clueless as to the emotional state of any cat I come across. Should I accept the invitation to pet the belly of a cat, or will they immediately pounce on my hand and gnaw on it? These are the questions of the greats, asked by Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. Does it want to be pet, or does it not? And here I am, some thousands of years later, asking that same question. Perhaps we'll never know the answer. This might be surprising to some, but cats are nearsighted. A domestic cat's eyes are so large and placed so forward on their face that they can't focus on anything that is less than a foot in front of them. Outdoor cats tend to be more farsighted, but the indoor ones tend to be more nearsighted but they have something up their sleeve for this. They have very sensitive whiskers. By swinging those whiskers around, they can feel whatever it is that is in front of them. In addition to these whiskers, they also have impeccable night vision. Within their eyes are dark specializing cells called rods, and even a reflective mirror that is in the back of their eyes. These two things working together so that they can see in the dark about eight times better than we can. Or maybe more precisely, they can see light at eight times a dimmer illumination than we can. There's even research from 2014 that suggests that cats can also see ultraviolet light. It seems we have covered a lot of animals that can see in ultraviolet light recently, but let's not forget that we can't, at least not with just our eyes. While they may be able to see UV light and have impeccable night vision, they can't see color all that well. 
their sense of smell isn't that strong, especially when comparing them to dogs. Smell is not the very top of their hierarchy when it comes to understanding their environment. Their hearing, on the other hand, is very sensitive. According to one study, cats can hear frequencies that are between 55 hertz to 78 kilohertz. We as human beings can only hear from between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. They have such a broad range of hearing that it is outshined only by porpoises and cattle, interestingly enough. And here we see something in the cat that we see in many other creatures. There is this gentle tug of war that happens in terms of how acute their senses are. Typically, when one sense is heightened, another will be lessened, at least relative to how acute that other sense is. An example would be a creature who has zero sight at all, but are able to detect very minute vibrations in the ground. In the case of the cat, it seems as though they have maxed out their skill points in hearing and in sight, maybe also in agility as well. And let us also not forget those whiskers of theirs. Their whiskers are about as sensitive as our fingertips, which is pretty cool. Another bit of a shocker for the domestic cat is that they have fewer taste buds than we do. They even have fewer taste buds than dogs. We as human beings have about 9,000 on average, while dogs will have about 1,700. Cats, on the other hand, have just 473. This allows them to taste things like bitterness, saltiness, savoriness, but they are limited to not being able to taste sweets like we do. This delivers to the cat an unfortunate curse that they can't taste ice cream. Let's go over some cat communication. Regardless of my being able to understand them, cats are masters at communication. They do a lot of it and in some nuanced ways. If their tail is quickly swishing around, it tends to mean aggression. When their tail is tucked, on the other hand, it usually means they are nervous. When they are in a relaxed state, their tail will just stay upwards and their ears forwards. There seems to be a phenomena with blinking at your cat that if you want to make your cat feel comfortable, you can look them in the eye and blink your eyes very slowly. This, as the article states, is recognized by them as a sign of friendliness, and you might even be able to see them returning that special blink back. I have no cat to try this out with, but you can let me know by sending in an email if you'd like. Hopefully this isn't bad information and instills aggression, but that would be on this article. Cats also engage in a behavior known as bunting. This refers to when they are rubbing their scent glands that are on their face around different objects, basically marking their territory, and so when they rub their faces on different kinds of furniture, other cats, or maybe even you, that could be what's going on here. It can also be used to, of course, bond with other cats or to show affection, but at the very least it does leave some scent behind. Domestic cats have a little claw that is found on the inner part of their wrist. This is referred to as the dew claw. This tiny little claw serves an important purpose of gripping. It is kind of like a thumb for us, though it doesn't do opposition, meaning it is not opposable. They cannot wrap their claws around something like we can wrap our thumbs around a mug, for example. But nonetheless, if this claw was not there, the cat would definitely miss it and notice it. Even the smallest little anatomical structures can have huge impacts on the quality of life and on the efficiency of movement. In addition to having those scent glands on their face, they also have them on their feet where those claws are. Now, in addition to those legs having little claws, they also have little scent glands on their feet. 
For the same reason they will rub their face into things to mark their territory, they will do the same thing, scratching furniture to do so. A way of getting around them, marking and scratching absolutely everything, is to give them something to intentionally scratch, like a scratching post. They are made to mark and to scratch, and so they will usually do so unless they're provided an outlet. Just like us, cats have been seen to prefer a particular paw. Maybe they are left pod or right pod. This is a phenomenon that we see spread across many species, not just the domestic cat and us. Something that has always been very cool to me is how cats always land on their feet. Now, we have very complex balancing systems in technology, in machinery. We have extraordinary things like gyroscopes and other sorts of innovation. The cat, on the other hand, has something entirely natural built within them that we have called the writing reflex. It is this reflex that allows them to orient themselves in such a way to almost always land on their feet. Now, they will not always land on their feet. It depends on how far away they are from the ground or on other variables. There was an interesting experiment in which scientists took cats into zero gravity. They did this in order to understand what the writing reflex would do in such an environment. And, as maybe one would expect, with the absence of gravity, the entire balancing system was thrown out of whack and they did some weird things in the air. And one last fact, just while we are here in Egypt, is that when a family cat died in an ancient Egyptian household, family members would sometimes shave their eyebrows as a sign of mourning for them. So cats were no light business in ancient Egypt. And now let's go to the name cat. Where does it come from or what does it mean? Well, this name, cat, was used as early as 700 AD. That is incredibly early. It comes from a West Germanic and then Proto-Germanic word going back to late Latin, catus. And it even goes farther back from Latin into Greek and possibly originates in some Afro-Asiatic language. The word that we use now for the domestic cat has such a rich history, maybe comparing to the rich history of the cat itself. And now let me just say a quick dad joke. As my hands are tied and I must, what is it called when you run out of treats to feed your cat? A catastrophe. Now that the emotional pain of that joke has been inflicted, we can go on to the review of the episode. This review is coming from Kim Birder Girl, who is writing all the way from the United States of America quite a ways away from Egypt, and Kim writes, I have abandoned all of my other podcasts and am only listening to Stefan, and that is saying quite a bit, since I listen to a podcast every night to sleep. I love his subtle jokes, soothing voice, and fascinating information regarding some animals that I have never heard of before, and he does it all without annoying loud commercials. What more could I ask for? Listening to him is like curling up by a warm fire with a piece of warm, homemade buttered bread. Thank you, Kim, for the abundance of kind words. I am glad that that is the analogy for what listening to my voice is like. I know that typically not everyone's voice is for everyone. I think this is clearly seen in some of the reviews that I have read on the show, those who refer to my voice as the incarnation of sadness, possibly one of my favorite comments I've received, but I am very glad that you like it, Kim. And there are so many other wonderful things you have written here that all I can say is that I am grateful for your listenership and I'm so happy that you are a part of the family we have built here. I do have to question the warm, homemade buttered bread by a warm fire. That sounds wonderful, but I have never done that in my life. 
and I would have a few questions. Is it the butter that is homemade, or is it the bread, or is it both? But in general, a bonfire with a warm piece of buttered bread sounds like a party. Sign me up. Leaving a review is one of the biggest things you can do to support the show. It really only takes a sec, and it has more impact than you could know. If you would like to request an animal for a future episode, you can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and click on the Submit and the Animal Request tab. If you would like to reach out to me, Steph Wolf, for any other reason, you can do so by sending a message to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com or by sending a message to relaxwithanimalfacts on Instagram. If you would like to support the mission of this show, that is, helping you relax and helping people understand the wonder of nature, all while getting more of the content you like, you can go to patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts. A huge shout out to George Vlad for the ambiance used in this episode. His work is linked in the description, and I encourage you to check it out. The resources used in this episode were nationalgeographic.com, petmd.com, livescience.com, and etimonline.com. What an amazing animal we have covered today. Again, one that is rather ordinary for many of us. But I will say, this is one of those creatures that is radically ordinary to us, or rather, one that we're very familiar with but it is one that instills more wonder than I have seen the others. I think it is because the cat really is a wonderful creature. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. This podcast is by you, for you, and your decision to spend this time with me here has made it just that much better. I look forward to learning more together on the next episode with the next animal. Take care.